Welcome to part one of the overview of patterns. In this module, we'll be talking about the importance of design experience and leveraging recurring design structure to become a master of software development. If you think about other realms of human endeavor, it's pretty clear that experts perform differently than beginners. Uh, for example, unlike novices, professional athletes, musicians, dancers, and so on, move fluidly and effortlessly without focusing on each individual movement. As an example, when I was a, a grad student about 20 years ago, I decided to take Latin dancing. So I went to Latin dance lessons and spent months practicing my steps with tango and uh, merengue and salsa and so on and eventually got brave enough to venture out to a club in LA where they did Latin dancing. Well, needless to say, to my chagrin, once I got there, I discovered that all the steps I'd learned and the way I was counting in my head was nowhere near as fluid and effortless as the people who were around me. And I felt a little embarrassed and uh, realized I had a lot more practice to do to become a master of dance. One of the things that happens, though, when you watch experts perform, it's easy to forget how much effort they put into reaching the high levels of achievement that they've attained. That's how I made myself feel better that night on my drive back home. I convinced myself that the people in the club who I'd seen who were so great had been dancing their entire lives, and I'd only been doing it for a few months. One of the crucial aspects of learning to master something is continuous repetition and practice, which is crucial to success. It's also important to be able to have mentoring from other experts who can help to figure out ways to overcome certain deficiencies and roadblocks that you have to your success. If we go back 30 years ago, when I was an undergraduate, I took karate. And we spent weeks and months practicing basic blocks, kicks, and punches under the close supervision of the black belts in the class, who gave us all kinds of tips on how to improve our form and to become masters of martial arts. You're not taking this course, however, to learn how to become a better dancer or a better athlete. You're taking this course to learn to become a better software developer. So let's talk a little bit about how you become a master software developer. If you were to take a look at the way that most universities teach people about programming and computer science and software, you might get the impression that the keys to success are knowledge of algorithms, data structures, and programming languages. I think it's important to have a tremendous amount of knowledge of those topics. But I think it's also important to keep things in perspective. Because if you're not careful, it's easy to fall prey to featureitis or worse. Let me give you an example. About 22 years ago, when I was a grad student, I spent a lot of time developing free software. And one of the pieces of free software I developed was something called gperf, which was a perfect hash function generator. A perfect hash function generator takes a set of keywords and computes an algorithm that will generate a lookup table that allows you to determine whether a new keyword or a new word is a member of the set of keywords in constant amount of time. This is very useful for things like compiler parsers and lexical analyzers. In fact, gperf was used in the GNU C and C++ compilers for uh, many years. And I had a great time developing this software. I would spend a lot of time working on algorithms for doing the perfect hash function, processing effectively and efficiently, various clever data structures to do lookups in the internal implementations. And I spent a lot of time writing generators for C++ and C and Ada and Pascal and other languages of the time. And after I put my source code out in open source form, I began to get a lot of people using it. And that's where the problems began. Because what had turned out was that I had done a great job on the knowledges of the algorithms and the data structures, and had also been working closely with the developer of G++, the GNU C++ compiler. And every time he put out a new release, I'd update gperf to use the latest and greatest C++ features at the time. But unfortunately, I'd hard-coded the algorithms. I'd hard-coded the data structures. I'd hard-coded the generators. So when people came to me and asked for new features, asked to be able to change the algorithm, asked to be able to have new generators for new languages, I was in a pickle because I'd programmed myself into a corner. And so it spent, I had to spend a lot of time adding those features and enhancing the software. Well, the way I solved the problem was eventually to turn over gperf 
to the Free Software, Software Foundation for maintenance. And if you take a look, you'll see that GPERF is actually part of the Free Software Foundation's GNU release. And uh, it's, it's enjoyed a wide popularity for a long amount of time. But I never forgot the important lessons of over-focus on programming languages at the expense of good design. Sometimes you can go even further. You can take it to the extreme with an obsession with programming languages. Here's a fun example, which is a winner from the 2006 obfuscated C code contest for the best one-liner. And believe it or not, if you compile this code, it will generate an output that will tell you the time of day when the code was compiled. Now, I have nothing but the utmost respect for developers who have mastered C to this point. On the other hand, I sure as heck don't want to have to try to maintain that code either. Another way to look about mastery of software is to take a look at the kinds of things you might learn in a software engineering course. If you take a look at software engineering courses, you might get the impression that the key to mastery of software lies in understanding design notations, things like the unified modeling language. Uh, structure charts, interaction diagrams, sequence diagrams, and so on. These ways of representing software are very effective for specification and documentation because they omit mundane implementation details and focus on the relationships between key design entities in the software. So it becomes easier to understand things because you're abstracting away from the details to see what's actually underlying the software architecture and structure. Uh, and this is great, but we have to keep a few things in mind. These diagrams tell us what the software does and perhaps to some extent how it does it, but they don't explain why the software is arranged that way. That's not easily conveyed in the diagrams unless you're very careful in their application and the use of more advanced notations in UML. Another key theme to remember here is that good software design is more than just drawing pictures. Just because you're an artist or a draftsman doesn't necessarily mean you're a good architect. Uh, recently, I've had this experience. My family and I are building a house, and we've discovered the wonders of online tools for being able to do various kinds of layouts of the walls and the windows and the structures. And you can actually do some pretty sophisticated 3D modeling of your house design. And so we've created lots of pretty pictures. The downside, of course, is that we're not architects of buildings. So we don't really understand things like energy conservation. We don't understand the concept of load-bearing walls. We don't understand how to lay out the plumbing or the electrical outlets and so on, or the roof structure. So as a result, even though our pictures look pretty, if you were actually to try to build a house from them, it would be a complete fiasco because we don't have the deeper knowledge that comes from someone who's an expert in the domain of building architecture. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is that good software developers rely heavily on design experience. And this experience is at least as important as knowledge of programming languages, development environments, algorithms and data structures, and so on. Let me give you a quick example of how I learned of the importance of design experience in my own work. Uh, about 20 years ago, after my, uh, my fiasco with GPERF maintenance, I started to study a lot about patterns. And I was working for a company while I was a grad student doing some consulting work that was developing telecommunication switch network management software to manage and visualize and monitor the state of the switch. And we spent about six months developing some really nice software written in C++ uh, using some things we'll talk about later in this course, like the reactor pattern and the acceptor connector pattern and various frameworks and so on that embodied those patterns. And we implemented these on top of Unix. And we were doing very well, very proud of ourselves. And then one day I came to work and the big boss said, uh, we've got a meeting today, folks. So I didn't know any better, so I went to the meeting, all excited to talk about the great stuff we've been doing. And the boss said, uh, we've just received news that Unix is no longer the focus of what we're doing. We're now moving to Windows NT. Now keep in mind, this was 1993, so Windows NT had just been released. And he said, uh, we're not sure if your services will be required any, any longer, but if you can retool your software quickly enough to NT, we might think about keeping you around. Well, as it had turned out, because we'd used abstraction, because we'd understood design uh, frameworks and patterns, we were able to retarget our software frameworks to Windows NT very rapidly within a couple weeks. And that allowed us to continue doing work for the company. About six months later, we had another meeting. By that point, I began to realize that meetings were sometimes a big problem. 
We went to the meeting and the big boss said, we've just received news that we're no longer in the private branch exchange business with this line of code. We're now going to be focusing on central office switches. And once again, we're not sure if we need your services any longer, but if you can find a way to retool your software quickly, we might keep you around. Well, once again, because we leverage design experience, because we develop software abstractly using patterns and frameworks, we were able to take our existing PBX management software and move it over to the central office software within just a couple weeks. And so I learned some important things from these particular experiences. I learned that design experience makes the code easier to change, easier to port, easier to maintain and evolve. And it's also a way to ensure job security, which is a big deal as well. If you take a look, there's a number of papers at my website that talk more about some of the experiences with these projects. So that begs the question, where should design experience reside? If you take a look at well-structured software, you'll discover very quickly that it exhibits recurring structure and behaviors. And these behaviors promote good properties of software, abstraction, flexibility, reuse, quality, modularity. Abstraction allows us to emphasize what's important and de-emphasize the unimportant at a particular level of detail. Flexibility allows us to take something we've developed before and apply it in more flexible ways, in ways that we didn't necessarily anticipate originally. Reuse allows us to be able to take things we developed and apply them in new contexts where they weren't necessarily designed. Quality, of course, helps you to remove bugs, fix vulnerabilities, make your, your code more bulletproof. And modularity allows you to divide and conquer a big problem space into smaller chunks so people can work in isolation because you've emphasized coupling and cohesion appropriately. And therein, those design structures lies a great degree of knowledge that's very important. Unfortunately, this type of design knowledge historically has resided in several locations. One of the locations is in the heads of the experts, and uh, the other location is buried deep within the source code. Both of these locations are fraught with danger. If the design structures are in the heads of the experts, then what happens if they get hit by a truck, or something falls in their head, or more likely, they decide to move on to greener pastures? You've lost that knowledge. Likewise, trying to reverse engineer these structures and behaviors from the source code is incredibly tedious and error prone and costly. And no two people may do it quite the same, which means that you'll end up with different perceptions on how the software is designed. So to summarize this first part of the overview of patterns module, achieving mastery of software development requires continuous repetition, practice, and mentoring from experts. And that, of course, is where courses like the Coursera series come in valuable. You can go back and watch these videos over and over again until you get the hang of it. Uh, it's also important, of course, to have access to software, real industrial strength production software to learn from. That's where things like Ace and Android come in handy because you can go and see how people have built the software. And these are often, these frameworks are often documented using patterns effectively. It's also clear that good software developers rely heavily on experience gleaned from successful software designs. Uh, I could not possibly have continued with my job at that telecommunications company monitoring system had I not been able to leverage the experience gained by several generations of building this software and then finding ways to retool it quickly and rapidly to new environments and new platforms. But what's most important is we have to figure out some way, some means of being able to extract document, convey, apply, and preserve this design experience in a way that's going to save time, reduce effort, and minimize risk. And that, of course, motivates the focus on patterns, which is what we're going to talk about next.